Psalm 54, to the chief musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is David not hiding among us? And the words read, save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Okay, today we're going to be looking at Genesis 43, verses 15 through 25, and our sermon is entitled, Peace to You. Do not be afraid. So starting in verse 15 of chapter 43, we read these words. So the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready. For these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us, to take us as slaves with their donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, O oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. But he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. <laughs> I have said this a few sermons in a row, and I need to say it again today, that we have an ongoing picture here. This isn't something that's a complete story in and of itself. It's leading towards something that is pictured uh, elsewhere in the Bible, which is future to us now. And uh, when we get to those particular uh, verses, it really is beautiful how we can see the re uh, reconciliation of Jesus and his brothers, uh, the people of Israel. But for right now, this is an interim sermon. So I'd like you to be aware of that. And uh, it may seem like we're stopping at kind of a funny verse. It will all make sense when we get to that final reconciliation between them. In uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, it says this concerning Israel. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. There is the loving relationship which is seen throughout Scripture between the Lord and Israel. But there is also the truth that God cannot compromise in his very nature, even for those he loves. God is not like a man where he changes or where he overlooks our faults. Every wrong must be judged, and every act of rebellion carries a cost. How God deals with these things is perfectly fair, and yet it is always perfectly executed to bring about the most propitious outcome for the objects of his affection. If we sin against God, our sin must be judged. But God has made it such that our sin can be judged in a perfect substitute. And so our wrongs will in fact either be judged in us or they will be judged in him our perfect substitute, who is Jesus. But either way, they will be judged. In order to bring his people Israel to the point where they realize this, he has had to refine them through the, the trial of uh, time and exile. These punishments were told to them in advance, and so they can't claim that their treatment has been unfair. And during the time of exile, any Jew, just like any Gentile, has had the opportunity to seek out Christ to come outside of the camp and to bear his reproach individually. But national Israel, the collective group of people who bear that name are treated differently. Yes, each must come to Christ individually, but collectively they must call on him as a nation. 
There must be a national awakening before he will return to them and to rule among them. In preparation for that time, God is working out his plans to bring them to the point where it will actually happen. And this is not an if, it is a when. The Bible is already written and it says that these things will come about. Joseph is working out a plan in hopes of reconciliation with his brothers. This plan, and especially the words and the terms used in the Bible, give us insights into how God is doing the same thing towards those he has loved with an everlasting love. He is drawing them with cords of loving kindness woven into the fabric of human history to bring them back to him. Our text verse today comes from Isaiah chapter 45. Listen to these words. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. God spoke to Cyrus, the king of Persia, through the hand of Isaiah, telling him that he would give him the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. But then he tells why he was doing this. It was for the sake of Jacob, for Israel, his elect people. He used a pagan ruler to bless his people and return them to their land. He used him to fund the rebuilding of the temple of God in Jerusalem. And how did that come about? Isaiah wrote his words, naming Cyrus by name almost 200 years before he was born. King Cyrus was read a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and when he heard that the Lord had called him this way, he responded in stunned awe, authorizing the rebuilding of the temple exactly as the word spoke. The letter that Cyrus wrote to approve the construction is so important that it's recorded at the end of two chronicles and then again at the beginning of the book of Ezra. Astonishingly, God used his word spoken in advance of the occasion to bring about the events of the future, which his word predicted. And the same thing is hinted at in today's passage. There is treasure which is in the sacks of the brothers of Joseph, which points to the treasure which is hidden in God's word, all about Israel's future. All they need to do is go to the word and search it out. When they do, the word will affect the changes that are predicted in the word. Yes, this is the immensity of what God has and continues to accomplish through his word. It's all to be found there. And so may God speak to us through his word today and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have three thoughts for you today. The first is a second trip to Egypt. This is verses 15 through 18. Verse 15 says, so the men took that present in Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. Now it might seem trivial, trivial to you, but the term the men, which in Hebrew is ha-anashim, was never used in the previous chapter. When speaking of the sons of Israel, they are either called just that, the sons of Israel, or pronouns are used like we or they. In fact, because I was curious, I went back and I checked and found that the only other time that they have been called the men was in Genesis 34 when they found out that their sister Dinah was raped. And if you know that story, it kind of looked for an impartial evaluation of what had happened and why the events occurred. No other instance of the term is applied to the brothers of Israel since then. That was 23 sermons ago, almost six months of sermons. But in this chapter, starting with this verse, they are called the men. They will be called this seven times before the chapter is out. It is as if the Bible is making the entire account as impersonal as possible concerning them. Every move they make is being evaluated with a cautious eye. It's as if a time of testing is being foreshadowed before they can again be considered a part of the covenant community. If you can see the connection between them here and the people of Israel now, it explains why the impersonal term is used about them. What did Paul say about being a true Jew or not? We read his words in Romans chapter 2. He says this, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward and in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. 
The brothers have been alienated from Joseph while he has reigned over the land of the Gentiles. The Jews have been alienated from Jesus as he built his Gentile church. Now these brothers are being readied for the unveiling of Joseph's true status, and Israel is being readied for the same in Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, we read that God shows favoritism to no man. He is perfectly fair, perfectly righteous, and uncompromising in his very nature. The brothers of Joseph are Joseph's kin, but he is not going to accept them until he knows that they truly have had a change in heart. And the Jewish people, Israel, they're God's covenant people. They are the blood kin of Jesus, but until they are right with him, they will not be accepted by him. And this isn't a cold and uncaring God. I'll tell you what, if he were, they would have been abandoned eons ago. He is the covenant-keeping, always faithful, and loyal Lord. But he is also, as I said, just, righteous, and holy. He cares enough to allow them to choose or reject, and he cares enough to refine them in the process, leading them to repentance and leading them back to himself. One is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is in the flesh of the life they trod. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, in the heart and in the spirit, whose praise is not from men, but from God. The story of Joseph is merely prefiguring the greater love story of Jesus, working towards reconciliation with wayward Israel. Little terms like the men show us that there is this impartial evaluation going on. In due time, they will have to prove their faithfulness, as will Israel in the future. They are taking along a present, and they're taking their brother Benjamin. They're also bringing restoration money and more purchase money, and they're heading off to Egypt. There, they now stand before Joseph. Verse 16, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. When Joseph saw Benjamin, his eyes fixed on his younger brother, they were told to either bring Benjamin or don't come back, and they have brought him along. With no comment to them at all, he simply instructs the steward to take the men, ha anashim, to his personal residence and slaughter an animal. In Hebrew, it uses the term teboach, tebach, slaying a sleigh. It is to be a great feast and not just a meal. Everything is being prepared as if for a banquet. And the time is set for noon. And a little squiggle for your brain here. It's kind of interesting. The Hebrew for noon is much more descriptive than the English. The word is batzahoraim, which means at the double lights. In the heat of day, at the double lights, when the sun is the strongest, the people would break and go indoors to have a meal. Verse 17, Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. At one time, this was Joseph's job. Remember that? He was the servant of a house. He worked for a guy named Potiphar. And uh, he uh, simply obeyed and performed his duty. Now Joseph is the one in authority, having risen from the lowly position of servant to the highest position in the land. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Our suffering servant now exalted to the highest position. All heaven and earth is subservient to him. It's amazing. And for the third time in three verses, the brothers are called Ha'anashim, the men. Everything is as impersonal as it can be, not just from Joseph's mouth, but from the perspective of the Bible itself. Instead of them or they, we read the men. There is an evaluation being made, and we have been allowed to participate in it. The words are used, and they're selected for us to see it, and to pay attention, and to learn from it. The words of Zechariah chapter 13 reflect the overall evaluation which will come upon Israel in the future. This is speaking of the same type of pattern, but Israel future to us now. Here's what it says. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. The brothers of Joseph are being tested, though they don't know it yet. Then the people of Israel will be tested as well. They will be refined, and they will be purified. They will be taken through the fire, and those who survive the ordeal, ordeal will be brought out, forgiven, and spotless. 
And the curious thing, though, is that the brothers didn't know who Joseph was. He's standing right there in front of them, and they really don't have anything to hint to them about it. But Israel has it all clearly laid out in the scriptures, and they still don't see it. None are truly so blind as those who simply refuse to open their eyes and look more closely at what is before them. And I've got a perfect example of this for you from this past week. I don't know if you know who Bob Jones is. It's not the Bob Jones of Bob Jones University. It's a, uh, a guy that called himself a prophet. He made all kinds of prophecies. And uh, people just followed after him all the time. Well, he died this past week. And uh, it, it, he has just a litany of failed prophecies. He'd say something and then they have proof that it was uh, false. And, you know, I saw people posting him on Facebook saying, what a great man of God. And, you know, how, how he was such a, a prophet for God. And all it took in the Old Testament was one failed prophecy and the man was to be stoned to death. And this guy had a litany of them and people just followed after him. Makes me think of a guy named Popoff, if you know who he is. He's out in California. He's one of these guys that uh, has a show and people send him money and he sends him miracle healing water and he walks around in there and says, I know you have a heart ailment and we're going to heal you. And uh, he, uh, one day somebody took in a radio receiver and they listened to him. He had a thing in his ear and it was... Uh, uh, somebody up in the booth was telling him, well, we interviewed the guy on the way in and he has a heart condition. He's in row three, second chair in or something. And so they proved that he was false. They proved it. And people still go to this guy's church and they still send him money. He's millions and millions of dollars he makes. People will not open their eyes and see the truth of what is before them. Now, I'm going to tell you something that happened in the past week that, or actually yesterday when I was at mission work. It happened two weeks ago. And you want to talk about the true power of Jesus Christ. It's not found in false prophets and false prophecies. There's a family that we've ministered to now for six years. It's a Hispanic family. We see them every single week. And uh, they are the light of our time as we walk around the projects with the exception of one other woman who's 98 and sings us a song every week. But this Hispanic family, we've seen them grow from little children growing up. And uh, one of them has some severe troubles. She has some real trials in her life. She's got some, she has to take medications for something wrong up here. And uh, she's, she's really struggled with this. She, uh, I, I don't want to give away too many details, but uh, she had to be committed, Baker acted, if you know what that means, because uh, something happened uh, life-threatening. And uh, anyway, uh, two weeks ago, when we were out, uh, the parents told me that she had been Baker acted. And uh, I asked, do you mind if I go to see her? And they said, no, and there's a one hour window that you can go visit. So after we had lunch, after uh, the mission work, uh, I went over there and as a uh, minister, I was allowed in and I sat and I talked with her and I left and that was the end of it. I, I talked to her about Jesus and uh, she bowed her head quietly, didn't say anything out loud, but she received Jesus as her Lord and uh, I left. And uh, I, did, I wasn't at mission work last week and the reason why is because I performed a funeral service. And so I didn't know anything about what had happened. But uh, yesterday when I went, I met with the gentleman that I usually go with. Uh, they said, we have something to tell you. And uh, we stopped and talked and they said that uh, the parents of this girl, they said they walked up to the house and they said they were literally glowing. It was as if they were glowing. And they said, what, what's going on? They, they had joy that they could not contain. And they said, well, we got a call from one of the psychiatrists at this uh, place, and uh, he said, we don't know what's happened, but, but your daughter has completely, completely changed. They said, we, we have never seen such a change in a person, ever. And they said, we want to know what the old man with the beard said to her. And so I didn't really appreciate being called an old man, but uh, uh, they, the only way they could describe it in their limited way of explaining things was this. They said she had just changed that quickly. And, uh, you know, I was kind of fearful as I was walking around with them because it's now been two weeks. And, you know, things change really quickly in life and little girls get disillusioned very quickly. And uh, we walked up to the house and the glow was still there two weeks later. She's back home. They, they are completely at a loss as to what happened in this girl's life. And all it is is the power of Jesus Christ. It's not an old man talking to her. It's the power of Christ. So we don't need false prophets. We don't need Bob Jones and we don't need pop-offs to make stuff up on stage. What we need is people to tell other people about Jesus Christ and changes can happen. And I broke down in tears. I, I couldn't believe what I had heard because to me it was just done. I've talked to a, the little girl and she's going to go through a life of trouble and Jesus felt otherwise. 
absolutely astonishing, the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And this is the astonishing thing about Israel today. If there's any evidence that there is a God and that he is continuing to work in history, it is not the church. It is Israel. That's where the evidence lies. The church has divided. It's fallen away and it's failed to live up to the great name that established it. On the other hand, Israel, disobedient as they are, has remained throughout eons of persecution. They have had their ancient language reborn on the tongues of the people and they've been planted in God's land once again. And all of it was predicted in advance, in detail. Even the church has in large part failed to see this. And Israel, they've attributed their current state to Jewish greatness, to luck, chance, whatever. But very rare is the Jew who will say the Bible showed it. And sure enough, the Bible was right. Until they see the God who caused these things for who he is, they will continue to face difficult ordeals that the Bible says will come. Verse 18, now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. Adam Clark relays to us that a guilty conscience needs no accuser. The Geneva Bible amends it a little bit and it explains just who their accuser really is. Speaking of the brothers, their commentary says, so the judgment of God weighed on their consciences. We talked about the conscience a couple weeks ago. You can have a seared conscience. You can have a humble conscience. You can uh, develop your conscience to become repentant, or you can completely push it away and suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But this is what's going on in these sons right now because they know that things aren't going right. God gives man a conscience, and it will eat away at us slowly, but completely. The exception is the person that has allowed his conscience to become completely seared. But the sons of Israel are not at that point. Instead, they are facing the consequences of bad decisions of the past, and their conscience is eating away at them. They had considered what they had done to Joseph the last time they were in Egypt. Remember, they were talking in front of him, and they were remorseful. But now they have the added burden that they didn't turn back when they originally found the money in their sacks as they headed home. These things have them frightened because of the importance of the place that they've been brought to. These guys are shepherds, and they've always lived, lived as shepherds. To stand in a large home, maybe for the very first time in their lives, would be intimidating and unnatural. Their life has been spent in tents and in the open fields, not in plush mansions. It is an overwhelming situation for them, which is exacerbated by events. And verse 18 continues, and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. The wisest course of action when they left last time, though obviously a difficult one, would have been to return right away and mention the money immediately. But with Simeon in prison, they would have been scared to even do that. Here in this verse, they use a term which we would be very unfamiliar with. We translate it as, he may make a case against us. But what it says is, lehithgolel elenu, that he may roll upon us. It's a metaphor which is taken from, believe it or not, the sport of wrestling. When one person overturns another, he'll roll on top of him and pin him down. And this is essentially what they're saying now. They're scared because of the money. He could accuse them and leave the blame on them. In fact, as the ruler, he could turn them into slaves. Job uses this exact same term when speaking of his afflictions and the attitude of the people towards him. Here's what it says from the American Standard Version in the book of Job, chapter 30. As th through a wide breach they come, in the midst of the ruin they roll themselves upon me. Same term being used there. The brothers are afraid that they will be pounced on, made into slaves, and even have their donkeys taken from them. Now that might sound a little funny, but as the donkeys are the only way of transporting the grain back to their family, it would be a complete calamity for all of the covenant people, even those back in Canaan. Lord, let not those who hate me roll upon me. Be my strength in this great battle of life. In you alone I, shall I trust and speak confidently. Only you can carry me through the times of strife. Our second thought today, resolving the issue of the money, verses 19 through 22. Verse 19 says, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house. The Bible notes here that they talked with the steward at the door of the house. 
It's as if they want to convince him that they've done nothing wrong, pay what they owe, and get away before Joseph comes. If they can resolve this now, even before entering the house, then they could have avoid what they fear is going to happen at lunchtime. The door of the house is the last spot before they are consigned to their fate, and so they linger there, and they there they stand and they make their case. Verse 20, and said, Oh, sir, and we indeed came down the first time to buy food. In the Hebrew's expressive way of explaining something, this verse literally says, Be adoni yarad yaradnu. Oh, sir, coming we came. Repetitions like this are missed in the English translation, and we lose some of the beauty of the dialogue. Coming we came, O oh sir, to buy food. What transpired after that has us worried and in a fret. It was an event which truly soured our mood, and our conscience isn't clear of it yet. Coming we came to buy food when this side issue arose. Verse 21. But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, so we have brought it back in our hand. So here they are getting the chance to explain how they ended up with the money they originally paid. And each time they use the word sack, it's a different word than what was originally used to describe the sack. The word here is amtachat. It's used only 15 times in the entire Bible, and all of those times are in this story between Genesis 42 and Genesis 44. The word comes from a root, mathach which means to spread out. Just as this sack is spread out to reveal the money, the story is spread out to reveal the hearts of the brothers. Joseph is using the unfolding events to discern the condition of his brother's hearts. And in the same way, Jesus will use the unfolding events of the tribulation period to discern the spiritual condition of his people, Israel. The Hebrew words within the text itself give us insight into how God deals with them. What the brothers tell the steward now doesn't really reveal everything, though. They explain that they received all their money back, and they brought it again to Egypt to make things right. But it doesn't really prove that they're honest, just that they're hungry and they, want, they don't want this to interfere with getting more food. But next, they show they've gone an extra step toward making things right. Verse 22, And we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. So not only did they bring back the original money, but they brought back money for more food that they want to buy. And their explanation is that they have no idea how they got their original money back. They've done everything they can to convince this guy before Joseph shows up and holds a trial against them. All they can do now is hope that their story will be accepted. They've told the truth. And their story is so unlikely that they're either very poor liars or somehow they're actually telling the truth about what happened. This is a principle, though, in this verse right here that Jesus will expand on in the New Testament. In Luke 12, he says this. And think of what's going on with these brothers before they meet the, uh, the Lord of the land. When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge... The judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you in prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you have paid the very last mite. And they're trying to do exactly what Jesus uh, recommended in the New Testament. They're trying to do it back in the book of Genesis. Our third thought today, preparing for the banquet. Verses 23 through 25. Verse 23 says, But he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. The steward of Joseph's house has been taught both the customs of the Hebrews and to fear the true God. This verse shows us both. In response to the explanation given by the brothers, he uses the term shalom lechem, peace to all of you. Shalom lechem, peace to you, my friends, all is well. God is in control. There is nothing you need to worry about. The future is safe in his hands. Surely you can tell. There is no need to fret, to worry, or to pout. The words shalom lechem are given less of a greeting, which in fact they are, but they're more of a note of encouragement here. In essence, he says, don't sweat it, don't worry about it at all. And then he uh, proceeds to explain why, as verse 23 continues, your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. In order for him to say this, he had to know who their God and the God of their father is. If nothing else, 
Joseph has schooled him in the matter and explained to his servant about the true God. And it is this God that has accordingly given him or them treasure. In this, Joseph is an example to any believer in the true God. We can't convert people to the truth, but we can at least open our mouth and tell them what the truth is. Whether it's people we work for, people we work with, or people who work for us, or whether it's just simply people we see from time to time. It's our responsibility to let them know what we believe and why we believe it. Joseph took the time to do this for the steward in his house. You got to think of it. All of the other responsibilities that this guy has running the land of Egypt, he took time to share the good news. How about you? Don't want to make you feel guilty, but how many of you have talked about Jesus to somebody in the past week? You heard life is busy. I know it is, but there are people that need to hear this word. And I'll tell you something. We got Paul and Elaine here who have graciously provided tracks for free. And you can take them and you can put them in your pocket. You go out to dinner and I know you all go out to the restaurant. Leave one for the waitress. You know, if you're going through McDonald's, leave one with the lady. at the. So they get thrown away. Big deal. If one in a thousand has an effect, Jesus says that the price of the human soul is worth more than the whole world. One person. So why not take advantage of those? Or why not just <laughs> simply stop and tell somebody about Jesus? It's that important. You know, we talked to this one young girl, this Hispanic girl I mentioned earlier for six years, and she was growing up. And so now it's time for her to hear the news because her life is in a real bad way. And we did. And now she's a part of God's kingdom. And that's all it takes is just simply opening your mouth and speaking. This is what he would have us do. And this steward now tells the brother some good news. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. The thing is that when they leave again with more grain, the money will again be in their sacks along with something else. The silver, or treasure as he calls it, actually pictures something else. The word is matmon, and it's described as a word which portrays the preciousness of an item which is greatly desired. It comes from a root word which has the specific nuance of hiding by burial. If the grain is picturing the word of God, as it, we clearly saw it is in a previous sermon, then the silver is picturing that which is hidden in the word. Remember, the brothers are picturing Israel. They have the word, but they've missed what it points to. The treasure that they have is, as the steward says, from your God and the God of your father. He has given them this treasure in his word, and the treasure is in the amtachat, that unusual word for sack. The treasure is discovered when the word is spread out. It's all about Jesus. And Israel has been given this treasure. It is something they cannot buy, but which is offered to them freely. The connection here should not be missed. Jesus is there everywhere in it if they will simply open their eyes and look. Since we started these Genesis sermons, we have uncovered hundreds, if not thousands, of references to Christ. I mean, we're, we're in our 108th Genesis sermon, and we found at least 10 in every, every single sermon. I'm certain of that. Thousands. We're, we're moving along, and it is all about Jesus. And Israel simply needs to look, to understand, and to accept. God is preparing them for their meeting with the Lord. It's all seen in these unusual words that keep popping up in the story, and then we may never see him again in the entire Bible. And so the steward finishes his explanation with the words, Kaspachem ba'alai, your money comes to me. Now, this isn't a lie. He did get the money. He simply refrains from telling them that after he received it, he put it back in their sacks. Verse 23 does continue. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Whew, that's all I can say. Finally, in this verse, as a tangible evidence that everything is going to be okay, Simeon has returned to his brothers. This had to be the biggest relief of all because if the intention was to arrest them, they would have left him in prison. But instead, he is brought out to join them. Simeon means he who hears. It's almost time for the brothers to hear the truth of the situation. And right now in human history, it is almost time for Israel to hear the truth of what they have missed for so long. Verse 24, So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. Then they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feed. With the matter of the money and their brother Simeon resolved, the steward brings them into the house. But once again, the Bible calls them Ha'anashim, the men. 
the Bible is continuing to make an impersonal evaluation of them as it seeks to reveal their heart and motivations. But what they had only a moment ago feared and tried to stave off is now a welcome gesture as they stop to wash their feet while the steward feeds the donkeys. Water is brought to them to prepare them for a relaxing and an enjoyable meal there in Joseph's house. The washing of their feet is equivalent in our modern society to taking somebody's hat and coat and telling them, just sit down and relax. The roads were dirty and the traveling was tiring, and so to have water to wash up was to make a guest welcome and comfortable for their visit. Now, to neglect this would be considered a breach of etiquette and is something that is actually seen in the Gospel of Luke. So, because we're not in the New Testament very often and because we've got about 1,600 years before we get to it, I'm going to go ahead and read you that passage from the New Testament. So, let's take a moment to look at this memorable account. Then one of the Pharisees asked him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his, her, her, his feet with her tears, and he wiped them and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simeon, or Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a credit, certain creditor who had two debtors, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me then, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simeon answered and said, I suppose the one he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Imagine that. This guy he's a ruler in the land, fails to have a servant, which you know he had him if he's a Pharisee, wash Jesus' feet. He invites him to his house and doesn't even do that for him. And this lady puts all of this devotion into this man, knowing that he is the only one that can help her out of the pit that she's in. And this guy's saying, oh, look, she's a sinner. Well, guess what? The Bible says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. He failed to look into the, the mirror and realize that he is included in that as well. This is what Jesus is trying to teach us throughout the entire Bible is that we desperately need him. That's what we need is Jesus. And we need to tell other people about it. And yet we fail to do it. And we walk around in our own self-righteousness and we condemn ourselves. Don't be like Simon. Verse 25, then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. The present that their father had put together before they left is brought out and it's made ready for the arrival of Joseph. This included balm, honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. These were the best of the fruits of the land and would be a worthy gift even to the king. And so they pre prepare for noon when they'll dine with the great ruler of the land of Egypt. The waiting must have made them anxious as they tried to anticipate what would transpire in the hours ahead. Well, this is where the passage ends today. Next week, we're going to finish chapter 43, and we're going to come closer to the brothers' date with destiny, which Joseph is planning for them. They will have some interesting trials to go through before he is revealed to them, but the same is true with Israel. Individually, Jews are coming to Christ daily, but as a people, it is just a, as a people, it's just a small portion who have had their eyes opened. There is a future meeting coming between them when they have their collective eyes opened to the truth. Until then, we need to continue to pray for Israel. But Christ is not just Lord of a nation. He is Lord of individuals. No country has title to him and no denomination has a claim on him. He is the Lord who needs to be approached individually. And it must be with empty hands and with open hearts. We cannot buy our way into heaven, nor can we earn our eternal home through good deeds. 
The only way to be reconciled to God is through faith in the work of Jesus Christ. So I want to tell you once again how you too can have the assurance of eternal life and pardon from sin, just in case you've never come to that epiphany yet. The Bible says, as I said about Simon, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. There is none that hasn't done this. There is none righteous. No, not one, it says. And then we're told that the wages of sin is death. That's what we get because of the life of sin that we have. We die. We die physically, but we also are dead spiritually because we are separated from God because of our sins. And the Bible with that glorious three-letter word says, but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where it comes from, and it's the only place it comes from. There's no other name under heaven given by which men must be saved. It is Jesus or it is nothing. And so Paul tells us the remedy. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You call out to Jesus. Jesus, I can't save myself, and I know i got sin in me. I need somebody to do it for me, and I know you are the only one that can do it. And nobody calls on a dead Lord. That's why we've got to believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. He was sinless, and God raised him because of that. He is Lord over all. Call on him and be reconciled to God through his precious blood. Our closing verse today comes from Colossians chapter 4. Here's what it says. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Remember I talked about the prophecy update? Our light affliction may be coming, but there is an exceeding glory which will make that pale. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What a great promise. Next week, we're going to finish up chapter 43. It'll be 26 through 34. It's entitled Rejoicing in the Presence of the Ruler. That'll be our 109th Genesis sermon. I'd like to tell you as I do each week, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. We see this in these Genesis sermons. Everything is working perfectly because God has them exactly where he wants them. And he has a good plan and a purpose for you. So call on him and let him do marvelous things for you and through you. And our poem today is called Peace to You, Do Not Be Afraid. So the men took that present in Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph just as planned. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them to the steward of his house, he said, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready our daily bread. For these men will dine with me at noon. Prepare the things now. The time is coming soon. The man did as Joseph ordered then, and into Joseph's house he brought the men. Now the men were more than a bit distraught, because into Joseph's house they were brought. And they said, It is because of the money we have this fuss, which was returned in our sacks the first time, that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us, to seize and take us as slaves with our donkeys for this perceived crime." When near to the steward of Joseph's house they drew, they talked with him at the door of the house as their fear grew, and said, O oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food from here. Then it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and behold, what did appear? And there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So in our hand we have brought it back, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food so we have no lacks. And to us, the matter wasn't funny. We don't know who put the money in our sacks. But he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I have not gone unpaid. I had your money. Please, about this matter, don't bother. Then he brought out to them Simeon and alleviated their worries. Now there were none. So into Joseph's house, he brought the men and gave them water as a friendly deed. And they washed their feet there and then, and he also gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there, and the time was approaching soon. The Bible continues to show in each story the wonderful details of redemption and grace. Every word points to the majestic glory of God's plan to restore us to the favor of his face. Lord, help each of us to want to know you more every day, and help us to walk in the noble and righteous way. May we not depart from seeking out the treasures of your word and pursuing you through fellowship and prayer. By these things, may we bring glory to our Lord 
until we are brought to you in the heavenly palace over there. Hallelujah and amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, here we are right in your glorious presence. And uh, we've uh, seen some marvelous things hidden away in your word, treasures that are just so beautiful. And they show us that your hand is upon history and that you are in control of all things. Every single thing happens according to your wisdom. And Lord, I'd like to say a special prayer to that family that's in the projects that uh, uh, received the blessing of grace upon that one daughter and that they would be able to, to continue to pursue you all the days of their life and to see your hand even in the trials which are surely going to come and to know that when things do go bad that there is an eternal hope in each of them because of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that there is no thing that we can do to be saved and after we're saved there is no thing we can do to lose that salvation. We are yours eternally because we are in your capable hands. What a great God you are. Please look after each person here today and for those that may be watching on YouTube and just bless them with a double blessing and fill their hearts with uh, happiness and their souls with joy. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers and being attentive to them. And thank you for the greatest gift of all. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen.